we have a difficult topic to address this evening. And I want to begin by assuring you that I do not come here to, to bash Muslims or uh, display any disrespect to another religion. I've worked very closely with Muslims uh, professionally. I serve on the board of a mostly Muslim organization, the Iraq Memory Foundation. And I have seen the faith uh, of Muslims up close in situations that I don't think I myself could have endured. And uh, I spent, uh, to be more particular about it, several weeks with seven Iraqi Muslims, both Sunni and Shia, both Arab and Kurdish, who had had their right hands cut off by Saddam and their foreheads scarified to humiliate them. And they were told never to have any kind of prosthetic surgery so they could be living examples of Saddam's justice and so forth. They had spent a year in Abu Ghraib prison before this happened to them. And um, I, was, I was so impressed by these men who were amongst the survivors that after spending two weeks with them, the last meeting I had with them before they went back to Iraq, I said, I, as a Christian, salute you as Muslims for the depth of your faith in God. And they beamed. They beamed. I, I don't think I could have said anything to them uh, that would have made them happier or shown a greater level of respect to them, which I genuinely felt. I didn't manufacture that remark, believe me. On the other hand, in fact, this, this book, The Closing of the Muslim Mind, Jeff Nelson is here from Intercollegiate Studies Institute and ISI Books, which published this, I have to tell you, the publisher didn't find the title, The Closing of the Muslim Mind, sufficiently incendiary, so they added the subtitle, How Intellectual Suicide Created the Modern Islamist Crisis. Please buy the book so I can finance a home security system. <laughs> But I, in the spirit of what I just told you, I'm going to read to you the dedication of this book. To the courageous men and women throughout the Islamic world, here nameless for reasons of their own security, who are struggling for a reopening of the Muslim mind. Uh, just yesterday, I was talking to one of these courageous individuals uh, who happens to be in Washington right now. His name is Bassam Tibi. He's originally from Syria, though he's lived in Germany for uh, many years where he has been a professor. And uh, Bassam lived for uh, three years with 27, 24 by 7 German police bodyguards because of the fatwas that had been issued against him calling for his death as an apostate. Now, I recall almost a year ago, John was kind enough to invite me to a conference outside of Cologne in his other hat with the Knights of Malta. And he suggested, since this conference was going to be on Islam, that we, we have a Muslim there. And I said, I think you should invite Bassam Tibi, which, which he did. And indeed, Bassam attended this conference. And uh, when I saw the draft program, it said, Robert Riley is, and he repeated some of these delicious lies he just told you, and then said, author of the forthcoming book, The Dehellenization of Islam. I said, what? So I, call, I said, uh, John, uh, that, that's not the name of my book. He said, well, Bob, I know, but we have a Muslim coming, and I, I, don't, I don't want to offend him. And I said, well, um, that's okay. Uh, he knows the Muslim mind is closed. And if, if you think it's too sensitive, just don't mention the book. But you can't give it a new title. <laughs> so John courageously left the title, The Closing of the Muslim Mind, in the program. So there we are outside of Cologne, and Bassam Tibi is giving one of his lectures, and he says, it's just like Mr. Riley says in the title of his book, The Muslim Mind is Closed. And I looked over at John and said, aha, what did I tell you? So there we were. Um, 
Well, tonight we're going to talk about the challenge of Islam to Christianity and most particularly about the status of reason in Islam and the status of reason in Christianity. And I think in order to understand the status in these two respective faiths, we have to see the context in Revelation in which the question about reason arises in the first place. How many of you have read the Quran? A couple of you have tried. It's a very difficult book to read uh, and most extraordinarily difficult to anyone from the Western tradition because as you may know, uh, the Quran does not tell a story. It is organized into 114 surahs or chapters according to the length of the surah, going from the longest to the shortest. That's, that's not a narrative. It does, it's not that the Quran doesn't contain stories, it does. But the book itself doesn't have a beginning, a middle, or an end. It's, it is not a narrative. Um, were you to read it, you might find several things particularly startling as a Christian or as a Jew <coughs> or a person from the Western tradition. The first thing that you might be startled by is the relation of the incidents in Genesis as they appear in the Quran. And the first thing you will notice is that man is not made in the image and likeness of God. This is a notion that has so suffused our culture that for me to read you the following uh, would not startle or maybe even interest you. But you see from the Book of Wisdom this quote, for God formed man to be imperishable. The image of his own nature, he made him. Into the New Testament, from the letter of St. John, beloved, we are God's children now. Our relationship to God is familial. We are his children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. We do know that when it is revealed, we shall be like him. Like him? Like God? We are going to be somehow divine? That's what being made in his image means. Every day at Mass, at the offertory, the prayer is made. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in his divinity as he humbled himself to share in our humanity. Man sharing in the divinity of God. I can't possibly express to you how shocking this concept is to a Muslim. It is inconceivable. It is, in fact, blasphemous to suggest that man is in any way like God, can be in any way divine, or in somehow even in the afterlife share in his divinity is totally alien and, alien and, and uh, considered blasphemous. There is a notion expressing the concept of the one God in Islam that is called Tanza. Tanza is the term used by Muslims to express the total transcendence of the one God. This one God is incomparable. There is nothing to which you can compare him. And there is a standard uh, saying in Arabic in Islam without saying how and without comparing. 
God is so incomparably transcendent, so above his creature, that there is nothing you can say about him. You have no comparisons to make uh, to him in order to come to some understanding. To, su to suggest that you are in some way like him, or that even in the afterlife you're to, you're to share somehow in his divine life, is totally, totally alien to Islam. I will also suggest to you another thing that we will get into in a little further detail later. Well, what is that image of God in man that the Book of Wisdom is talking about and that the letter of St. John is referring to? What's the image of God in man that we are told about in Genesis? The image of his own nature he made them. Well, we're immortal, okay. Muslims believe that. They believe they have immortal souls and that their bodies will be reconstituted at the last judgment. But what is the image? Free will and reason. Two things, as we shall later see, that do not inhere in the central Islamic dogmas in the Sunni school of Islam. Um, there's another very startling thing to any Christian or Jew who reads the Genesis accounts in the Quran. And there's more than one such account, by the way. The Quran, if you do ever attempt to read it, you'll find it contains a great deal of repetition. Stories are repeated, slightly varied each time. There's no original sin. Adam and Eve do sin, but there is no cataclysmic dislocation in the relationship between God and man as a result of that sin. In fact, there is no differentiation within the Quran between that sin and any other sin that's recounted. In other words, as the Quran says, God being all forgiving and compassionate, he forgave them and we, and we just moved on. Therefore, in the Quran, there being no original sin, there is no offer of a savior who is going to come to restore this breach in the relationship between God and man, which man himself is incapable of doing because he being a creature, what has he to offer this infinite God whom he has offended? <clears throat> but then God in Genesis offers that there will be a savior coming and the difference between Christians and Jews is Christians think he's already come in the figure of Jesus Christ and the Jews are still waiting for him. But that is the basis of salvation history that's found in Genesis and throughout Judeo-Christian scriptures. There is no salvation history in Islam because there was no breach in the relationship between God and man because there was no relationship to begin with between this infinitely transcendent Allah and this abysmal creature. There was no breach in the, there was no relationship to be breached. And since I suggest to you that, I suggest to you that history <coughs> is the secularization of salvation history. That's why we have history in the West. We secularized salvation history. We came up with this idea of progress and so forth. And with Islam, and within Islam, there's no uh, salvation history, and in a way, as a result, no history. And you will find that history in Islam was actually something that Westerners began writing about Islam, which finally incited Muslims to write their own history. It's an intimately uh, connected uh, notions. So what do they believe in this respect in regard to revelation? Well, in Surah 5 in the Quran, you will see that the Muslim understanding of Jewish scripture, of the Torah, is that God gave what in essence is the Quran to the Jews first. And what did the Jews do with this trust? They broke it and they changed the words. They changed the words. Once again, 
as Westerners, we have no idea of the magnitude of that offense until we realize the way in which Muslims regard their scripture, the Quran. For the vast majority of Sunni Muslims, the Quran is not, as say, Christians con consider scripture as the inspired word of God. It is the literal word of God. It is not the Holy Spirit operating through St. John, leading us to accept and examine, for instance, the style of St. John and critically examining, well, this letter doesn't seem by St. John because it's not in his style. Such a conversation could not take place in any exegesis of uh, Quranic scripture because there is no human element in it. It was a literal recitation and transcription of what God said through Gabriel to Muhammad. Here we have another very interesting contrast between Islam and Christianity. And I owe John Haas uh, the thanks for this because at the conference outside of Cologne last summer, he invited this superb German theologian, Dr. Girl Falkowitz. She apparently is quite admired by Benedict XVI for her work. And she very, did a very nice job in contrasting Gabriel's appearance in the Quran and Gabriel's appearance in Luke chapter 2. In the Quran, this apparition or experience that Muhammad has is of an overwhelming, crushing one that happens three times. And he feels as if he's going to be destroyed. And he is overwhelmed and he is forced and he is commanded. And he, in fact, considers that this is satanic and only later is convinced that it was divine and that this was Gabriel dictating the words of Allah to him. But it was a command to do it. And it was done in this kind of semi-conscious <coughs> oriental uh, conception of the divine presence which overwhelms you. Your, your critical conscious faculties are lost and you fall into a kind of meditative, semi-conscious state in which you receive the word of God or God's presence. Contrasted to Luke 2, when Gabriel appears to Mary, what does she do? She inquires of the angel twice. He makes his announcement and she asks, well, how can this be? And only when she receives an answer satisfactory to her does she say, let it be done according to thy word. So it's a still conscious, rational acceptance of this experience and this message, not done in a semi-conscious, less than fully willful state. I thought that Dr. Girl Falkowitz's insight in this contrast is, is extremely instructive in that way as well. Now, the other thing you've got to be, realize about the Quran and what Muslims think of Christians is that I, in many ways they are not so much anti-Christian as they are anti a false conception of Christianity. Oh, let me get back to the Quran. So now you understand this is God's literal word. If you hold the Quran in Arabic today, it is thought by the Sunni Muslims, to be an exact replica of what is in an eternal tablet with Allah in uh, heaven that has existed co-eternally with him. The Quran is co-eternal with God. It's always existed precisely in the way in which it exists today in Arabic. God's language is Arabic. So the effrontery of changing a word that has existed through eternity with God himself is what the Jews are accused of doing. Therefore, as a result of what we see in Surah 5, the Jews are considered to have broken their covenant and therefore lost their right to live in the Holy Land. 
The Quran recognizes that Jews had a right to the Holy Land, but before they broke their covenant and changed God's words. As a result of which, I must tell you, after for following for any number of fruitless years the various peace processes in the Middle East, until there is a new interpretation of Surah 5, accepted by most Muslims, you will never find it acceptable to them that the Jews are back ruling in the Holy Land, not only exercising sovereignty in the Holy Land, to which they lost the right by changing God's word, but actually ruling over other Muslims. At the level of revelation, totally unacceptable. Okay, says the Quran, the Jews changed my word, so I did it again. I told the Christians, here is my word. And what do the Christians do? They come up with this ridiculous idea that I had a son. I never said that. And throughout the, the Quran, you will hear Isa, which is what they call Jesus, protesting repeatedly. I never said I was your son. I never said that. I wouldn't dare say that. And the conception of the Trinity contained in the Quran is exactly this. Consider this is what Muslims have to accept is true because it's the direct word of God. And that is that Christians believe the Trinity is the Father, Son, and Mary. Not the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Father, Son, and Mary is the conception the definition of the Trinity contained in the Quran. I don't know any Christian who thinks that's the Trinity. There was a tiny, obscure, heretical sect in uh, somewhere in northern Saudi Arabia, contemporaneous with Muhammad, that actually entertained this cockamamie idea, and that apparently is where he got it from. And if you read the Quran, you wonder where did he get the rest of his material, well, he got all of his material from the Torah and the New Testament, but filtered. He didn't have it firsthand. It said he was illiterate. We don't know that, but it said he was. And uh, most of the stories he repeats from the Old Testament and the New are some change. They're not quite right. The lineage isn't right. The names sometimes are wrong. And, of course, he gets the Trinity wrong. And... Um, uh, but the explanation for this final revelation that comes to him through Gabriel is Allah saying, okay, the Jews messed it up, the Christians messed it up, I'm going to do this one more time. Here it is. And you, Muhammad, are the seal of the prophets. You're the last one, because this is the last time I'm giving my revelation to man. Therefore, Muslims believe that the Quran supersedes all previous revelation, and that our account of revelation has been corrupted. So they really have no, absolutely no interest in, in reading it, and sometimes are told not to read it. And when Christians or Jews ask, well, how come there's no, fo there's no foretelling of Muhammad in salvation history? You know, the, the prophets keep telling someone's coming or this is the person who's coming. How come nobody said Muhammad's coming? And the answer is, well, that's precisely the part of the, the scripture that you corrupted. So you get kind of that caught in that little loop thinking that uh, this, by definition, is the final uncorrupted uh, revelation. And you, by the way, all were born Muslims. Adam was a Muslim, Abraham was a Muslim, Jesus was a Muslim. You were born Muslims, but you were apostatized probably by your parents. So the natural state of mankind is Islam. And you're not in that natural state because of this apostasy. And it is the job of Islam, of course, to, to bring man away from this apostasy and to Islam. So um, that's a little bit of a, I want to tell you, mention one other little very interesting thing. 
There are all kinds of uh, details in this repetition in their version of the story of Genesis that may seem incidental at first, but they're not at all incidental. They're extremely important. For instance, who names the animals in Genesis? Adam. The animals pray, Adam names him. Who names the animals in the Quran? God. It is symptomatic of the difference between the two views of man that in Genesis it is Adam who names the animals, while in the Quran it is Allah who does so. Naming was a sign of power over the thing named. Muslim man did not have this power, only Allah did. The great German thinker Joseph Pieper said the following. Reality becomes intelligible through words. Man speaks so that through naming things, what is real may become intelligible. Man's power to name things makes them intelligible to him. It is what enables him to comprehend them as they are. This means there is something intelligible in things themselves and that man's mind corresponds to this intelligibility through his rational powers and his use of language. As Aquinas said, we can apprehend created things because they were first thought by God. God gives us our reason. Our reason can apprehend the things that he thought and we can give them names corresponding to what they are. What is the significance of Muslim man's inability to name things at its deepest level? Ultimately, it means Muslim man has no access to reality. The power to name is the power to know. If you do not have this power to name, can you know? We'll explore that a little later, if you're still awake. <laughs> There's another very interesting thing I'd like to point out to you. In the Quran, almost everything happens as a result of God's direct action upon man. This is not so strange, is it, from reading the Old Testament? Almost everything that happens in the Old Testament is a result of God's direct action upon man and history. Go blow your trumpet around Jericho, the walls come tumbling down. Much of the history of the Old Testament is told in terms of the primary cause, God, directly affecting man and his history. The Quran also tells most of its story in this same fashion. However, in the New Testament, and the reason I mentioned this, we could get into this a little, is that this, this perspective of God directly acting upon and being not only the primary, but the only cause of things happening in the world has affected the Muslim mind to such an extent that you will see natural events in the world today being understood by them solely as a product of God as their direct cause. If you read any accounts of the tsunami or of the horrible uh, devastation in New Orleans, if you took a look uh, in the Middle Eastern and Muslim press, these were direct acts of God to publish, punish the infidels that had hit the, the beaches in India or in Indonesia exactly at the time when people were fornicating on the beach and God was punishing them for their sin. And indeed, I saw on one uh, Islamic site the tsunami wave taken by satellite and the Arabic script for Allah superimposed over the wave to show you that the wave spelled Allah. 
God's direct action. And we were being punished, of course, through Hurricane Katrina for being the infidel, imperialist, uh, materialist people that we are. So they still think very much in this Old Testament vein, which is the Quranic vein. In the New Testament, we see something very different being proffered. It makes clear that disasters and physical afflictions are not God's direct punishment for sin, significantly leaving open the possibility of other explanations, such as natural causes. In John chapter 9, verse 2, for example, the apostles ask Christ, quote, Rabbi, who hath sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Unquote. Christ answers, quote, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Unquote. Or in the other famous incident, uh, when 18 people are killed because of the collapse of the tower in Siloam, Christ refuted the explanation that they died as punishment for their sins in Luke chapter 4. Uh, this difference in understanding between Christian and Muslim revelation was extremely important for the development of Western civilization and for its lack in the development of Islamic civilization. Is there room for secondary natural causes? that if you get sick, you don't have to interpret your illness in terms of your moral standing with God and accept it only as a punishment from him for your sin, that it's okay to look for uh, an infection and treat it. This will launch us immediately into um, some of the metaphysical propositions in Islam that are so startling, ladies and gentlemen, that I am almost tempted to inflict upon you passages from 9th and 10th century Arabic Islamic theological texts. Don't do it. <laughs> we could stay in the room longer. No, still don't. Uh, and the reason why I have them in my book is because they are so radical that were I just simply to say this is the position of Islamic theology, people would say, well, you must be, uh, you're, you're an Orientalist, you're, you're anti-Islam, or this can't possibly be so. But it is so. And I think I supply evidence uh, plenty. I may actually inflict a little of it upon you so that you can see how extraordinarily radical it is. I mean, in the, 19th, in the 18th century, David Hume said that uh, cause and effect in the natural world did not occur, and they were simply co coincidences, right? But by the 18th century, in Western culture, we had a fairly good grip on reality that we could actually survive David Hume. Much earlier in the Islamic world, this became central Sunni doctrine. What just happened there? Gravity. What? Gravity. Shirk. You have just committed the sin of shirk. Within main school Islamic theology, God is not only the primary cause, he is the only cause. And to suggest that there are secondary natural causes and laws that inhere in things themselves which make them behave the way in which they do is shirk. Shirk is the sin of comparing anything to God. Remember, without comparing, the thing without asking how and without comparing, <coughs> by saying that this acts according to this law of gravity, which inheres in the physical world, is to say that there is a power other than God, and therefore you are a polytheist. And that is the sin of shirk. That's one of the most serious sins in Islam. So there are no natural laws. 
And if you wonder why is it there is such a paucity of science in the Islamic world today, you can trace it directly to the promulgation of the teaching that natural laws do not exist for theological reasons. Since the purpose of science is to discover natural laws, saying that they can't exist for theological reasons is a possible discouragement for the scientific enterprise. God directly causes everything. Now, this was not always the case. And this is actually the subject of the drama in the book, The Closing of the Muslim Mind. When John Haas gave the title, the imagined title to my book, The Dehellenization of Islam, he was on to something. How many of you have read the great uh, Benedict XVI uh, Regensburg lecture? Many of you have. In there, you will recall, he speaks of the dehellenization, principally of the West, our loss of reason. But in there, he also spoke of the dehellenization of Islam. And that, of course, caused a furor within the Muslim world. And many people scratched their heads thinking, gee, I didn't know there was a process of Hellenization to begin with. But in fact, there was. And it took place principally uh, beginning in the ninth century after Islam had conquered and absorbed a huge part of the Byzantine Empire and, of course, the Persian Empire. And in both the Persian and the Byzantine Empire, there were centers of Hellenic learning. And within the Byzantine Empire, uh, Greek philosophy had suffused Christian apologetics and thought. So as the Muslims began encountering these foreign notions, they wondered how they were to wrestle with their conquered peoples concerning their religions. You know, by the way, the general rule that the Muslims had when they conquered other peoples. Do I, should I go over that? You, would you like me to? Yes, OK. <laughs> The, um, this, this one true faith that supersedes all prior revelation through the seal of the prophets Muhammad uh, was given the message to spread throughout the world and bring all of it in subjection to Allah. Uh, what do, what do, you know what Islam means? Submission. Submission. But the purpose of Islam is not submission, it's salam, it's peace. Assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam, peace be with you. But you only achieve salam through Islam, submission. And you only have two ways of producing submission. One is dawah, which is proselytization. I offer you Islam, accept it. Or if you don't, jihad. Uh, and in fact, in, in formal Islamic uh, teaching and uh, law, uh, you must offer the infidel Islam three times. And after the third refusal, there exists a causus belli, that in Islamic just war teaching, if the infidel has refused Islam three times, he then becomes an obstacle to Islam and you have uh, a just war cause for attacking him. Now, if the people whom you have conquered uh, are infidels, if they are barbarians, uh, they have two choices, convert to Islam or execution. If you are a person of the book, which means either a Jew or a Christian, you have a third choice, which is to become a dhimmi, which is to acknowledge your submission uh, to the superior Islam by agreeing to play, pay the jizya, the tax, which allows you to, under very strict regulations, continue to practice your religion, but submissive to Islam and with all kinds of regulations. 
If you're, if you're a Christian or a Jew, you can't ride a horse or a camel. They're noble animals. You have to ride a donkey. You can't have a leather saddle. You have to have a wooden saddle. You can't ring your bells. You can't chant. You can't wear religious symbols, et cetera, et cetera. This goes on and on. So those were the basic uh, rules. Islam comes out of Saudi Arabia and conquers these two civilizations, which, which were by any respect superior to them the Persian and the Byzantine civilization. And they encounter this form of Hellenic thinking. What, what do they now do in the face of philosophy and this idea through man's rational powers that he can apprehend reality? That through man's reason, he can come to know the good and he can examine creation in such a way that it leads him to the conclusion that there must be a God, a first cause. But in any event, he can think about and arrive at an understanding of what's good and evil, what's just and unjust. What are the reasons why one would begin to think that there's such a thing as God? And once you arrive at the idea that perhaps God exists or that he must exist, is there a chance he's spoken to man? And if he spoke to man, how would you tell? There are a number of claimants. There are a number of scriptures. By what standard would you say, well, it appears reasonable to me that this may be God's speech to us. This may be us rather than this. What, what is it what, that we can know through our reason about God that would say, well, this is truthful. This does not seem to be. These are all questions that agitated the Muslim mind because they were present in Christianity and in Greek philosophy. And this became a huge factor in their thinking in the, in the early ninth century in the Abbasid dynasty. And they began examining their own scripture in light of this Greek philosophy. And the first fully developed school in Islam was called the Mutazilite. And they were the ones most uh, influenced by Greek philosophy. And they accepted the primary role of reason in exactly the way I just told you. The Caliph al-Mamun, perhaps the greatest Caliph in the history of the Arabic world, had a dream in which Aristotle came to him. And Caliph al-Mamun asked Aristotle, what is the good? And Aristotle answered in the dream, it is what is rationally good. And al-Mamun embraced this answer, and he embraced the Mutazilite school, and he embraced al-Kindi, the first Arab philosopher, who, while accepting Muslim scripture, said, we have to accept the truth from wherever it comes. And how much poorer we would be if we're offered the truth from somewhere else and we don't accept it just because it's not from us. And anything within our scripture that doesn't, uh, that appears unreasonable or that is against our reasonable reason means that we must be asked to understand it in another way, not just literally, but perhaps metaphorically because God, being reason himself, would not ask us to deny our reason to accept him. Does this all sound familiar to you? Of course it does. Because this era of Islam was subject to the same influences that formed Christianity itself. But in reaction to it and in opposition to it came the Asherite school that arose specifically to defy, deny, and destroy the Mutazilites. By the way, one key teaching of the Mutazilites was that the Quran did not exist co-eternally with God in heaven forever. That the Quran, yes, it was the word of God, but it was revealed in time, in history, to a specific man at a specific time in specific circumstances 
And in order to understand the revelation, you had to understand the context. The Quran, in other words, was not an ahistorical document. It was an historical one that required knowledge of all the languages that might be part of the, the language of the Quran itself, which was not God's language. But it was revealed at a certain time, at a certain point in history. So they would have no trouble with the kind of exegesis that has happened to Christian scriptures or Jewish scriptures or even translation of those scriptures. This was considered a scandal to the traditional Muslims and to the Ashurite school of theology that rose in opposition to it that said, oh no, <clears throat> the Quran is ahistorical, it's existed all the time. What's more, God is not reason and justice. The Mutazilites say, Man must be free, otherwise God couldn't punish him for doing something that's wrong. Well, how could, if he was forced to do it, well, how could you punish someone for what they were forced to do? Also, if man couldn't know it was good or evil, what, what kind of moral import would his behavior have? So man must be able to know what's good and evil, and he must be free, otherwise what could God's justice possibly mean? So they became known as the people of God's justice and rationality. The Asherites, quite to the contrary, said, no, God is will and power. Not justice and reason, will and power. He is pure will, unconstrained by anything. He can do anything at any time. In fact, anything that is done is done by him. And whatever he does is by definition good. They came up with a very peculiar metaphysics to support this idea that they borrowed from Greek atomism. And this ties into this denial of cause and effect in the natural order that I was telling you about before. This is, the world is composed of space and time atoms, little granules of space and time that have no nature in and of themselves. And the reason that they cohere in any instant to make anything such as you is because God wills directly, instantaneously, for the moment that these atoms are you. However, the atoms in you have no nature of themselves. They have no order of themselves that would lead you to think that you're going to remain you for the next instant. What has actually happened is all those atoms have been annihilated and a new set of atoms created that makes it appear that you have continued in some kind of continuous existence. The plant over there would you suggest that's going to remain a plant uh, by the time I finish the sentence because it has a nature of the plant? When any of you say, that, you already committed shirk, don't nod your head. <laughs> Anyone else suggest it would do that because it, it has the nature of a plant? Shirk, sir. You have just committed shirk. That plant is only what it is for the moment it is because God has chosen for the instant to agglomerate the time-space atoms to be that plant. And he has to do it all over again to keep it being a plant. So you might say along with Aristotle that a, an acorn is going to become an oak tree. And that nowhere along the trajectory of the growth from an acorn to an oak tree is it going to become, for instance, a dog or a man. Shirk. Sure. They deny this explicitly. It is only keeping a familiar sequence because Allah chooses at that instant to keep it in a familiar sequence, but he can just as well choose to do otherwise. And to say that he cannot is an act of shirk and blasphemy. And you are an apostate for saying so. So things have no nature in and of themselves. This is the most profoundly anti-Aristotelian teaching you could possibly conceive of. And extend this to moral reasoning and ethics. K 
Can you know what's good and evil? No. Why? Because things are not good or evil in themselves. They have no nature. So how can you tell if something is going against its nature or with it? We conceive of ourselves as having a nature and those actions which fulfill our nature and make us more human to be those things which are good, which is because God created this telos, this end in us, and those bad, those things which harm our nature. Pornography is evil because it's a lie about our generative powers. We can think this through and arrive at this. No, you can't. In this form of Islam, there is no Nicomachean ethics by Aristotle. Man cannot know what is good and what is evil. <clears throat> All things are neutral, and they are only good and evil because Allah says so. God does not forbid, forbid murder because it is evil. It is evil because he forbids it. And tomorrow he could say the reverse and make murder obligatory for us. I could read you the texts. Lying only because God says not to do so. Tomorrow he could say do it and we would have to lie. Idolatry, bad because God says not. tomorrow he might choose idolatry for us. Ibn Hazm, the Spanish thinker whom the Pope quoted in the Regensburg speech as saying God is not even constrained by his own word. He can do anything. And to suggest that he is constrained by anything is an act of blasphemy. It's saying God is limited and we know he's omnipotent and that he's pure will. Now as startling as this may strike you, every monotheistic form of religion has been tempted in this direction, including Christianity, into this form of voluntarism and occasionalism, which are the formal names of these doctrines. This happened in the Middle Ages with Duns Scotus. Uh, we could see it in the millenarian movements in the late Middle Ages. But this kind of radical occasionalism and voluntarism never got the grip on Christianity that it did on Islam for one very good reason. And that is the beginning of the Gospel of St. John. And the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, all things were made through him, etc. The Word, as you know, in the Greek is logos, translated in Latin as ratio, one meaning of which is reason. God is reason. In the beginning was reason, logos. And all things were made through reason. So St. John stands there as a bulwark against this kind of extremism in this notion of God's omnipotence and God is pure will. And not only is God himself reason, but since all things were made through his word and are sustained by his word, notice in the gospel it doesn't say all things are sustained by God's will, it says they're sustained by his word, by his logos, meaning, the imprint of the rationality in the essence of God is reflected in his creation, which is why he asks us to examine that creation to come to know him, because the rational order in creation is his imprint. It's not a limitation of him, on him, it's an expression of him. This is forbidden in Asherite Sunni Islam to say any of these things. Therefore, how are you to know what is good and evil? The greatest theologian in Islam, considered to be so to this day, the 11th and early 12th century, theologian Al-Ghazali said, no, no moral obligations flow from reason, but from Sharia. No obligations flow from reason. Nothing you can know by your reason can tell you anything 
about whether what you're going to do or consider doing is good or bad, is just or unjust. There's a famous line in the Quran that says, what you, what you, what you may like to do is not good for you. And what you do not like to do is good for you. God knows, but you do not. The extension of this saying is not only do you not know, but you cannot know. It is not there to be known. The Mutazilites said, scripture doesn't constitute what is good and evil, it reveals what is good and evil. It reveals what you otherwise could know by your reason, and that's why your reason finds it copacetic. The Asherite position is exactly the opposite, saying the only way you can know is through revelation, what God says. Because revelation doesn't reveal what is good, it makes what is good and evil. What this has resulted in, which you can observe today, is a kind of profound moral adolescence in many Muslims. Since you cannot know through your reason the moral character of an act, and you know as a Muslim that your salvation depends on your doing what is good and avoiding what is evil, how are you supposed to know? Well, you have to be very well schooled in Islamic jurisprudence and Sharia to know it. Not many Muslims have this kind of education. So how, how, how are you supposed to find out? Well, you, you, you contact someone who's supposed to know, which is an imam or a qadi, someone uh, schooled in Islamic jurisprudence. So well, how does the man in the street in the Muslim world handle this? Well, in Cairo today, you have the dial a fatwa program. You phone with an extra charge from the company to reach uh, imams who are standing by with their headsets, and you can uh, meet your moral quandaries this way. There are uh, live fatwa shows on TV. Talk to the imam, call in, he gives his judgments. The chief mufti of Egypt, uh, Ali Goma, who just died uh, six months ago, <clears throat> was getting th uh, requests for 3,000 fatwas a day. He had to hire 20 imams to crank out the fatwas. And that's just one source of fatwas. That doesn't include Al-Azhar University. There are multiple sources of, of, of uh, providing these judgments. And that's the kind of uh, moral infantilization you're left with because of this moral agnosticism, your inability for reason to, to think morally. Uh, one, one fatwa related by Father Samir, Samir Khalil Samir, who's an Egyptian Jesuit, advisor to the Pope on Islam, very profound thinking man. A woman called in and said, um, I'm taking a bath in my apartment, and there's a dog in the apartment. Can I get out of my bath with the dog is there? Now, you might not think this is a problem, but in Islam, uh, a dog is an unclean animal. So what's a woman naked when this is a dog there? What's she supposed to do? So the ruling was, if the dog is a male, it's haram. It's forbidden. If the dog is a female, you, you can get out of your bath. Uh, if you're saying a prayer and a woman walks by, do you have to repeat the prayer? Yes, you do, because a woman is unclean. Um, or this is, a, this is a very lively example for you from the head of the Hadith section at Al-Azhar. Al-Azhar, as you may know, is the senior most institution in the Islamic world. And the Hadith apart department is, is a big deal. Next to the Quran, the next source of um, scriptural authenticity and revelation are the hadith, which are the sayings and doings of Muhammad. And the head of the hadith section, we're not talking about an assistant professor, we're talking about a very big deal, is given the, the following quandary. If a man and a woman who are not related 
are put in a situation where they have to work together alone in an office, uh, what can they do? Because by every understanding of Sharia, it is forbidden for an unrelated man and woman to work alone in an office. So the answer from the Hadith section was that if the woman breastfeeds the man, it's okay. Because breastfeeding the man establishes a familial connection between her and the man, and they can continue to work together without any moral obloquy. Now, I see the way you're looking at me, which is why I like to read from text, because people don't believe this. <laughs> to the credit of the Egyptians, by the way, that comes from a hadith. The, he, he was basing his authority to issue that fatwa on a hadith in which Muhammad uh, said to do this. He's also said to laugh after he said it, but <laughs> the Egyptians, uh, there was an uproar in Egypt, and, and uh, the professor was forced, forced to withdraw his, his fatwa. But this is just an example to you of this kind of moral infantilization that takes place because of the collapse of epistemology within mainstream Sunni Islam, that man is unable to think about things morally. I see I've yammered on for a considerable period of time. I'm just going to leave you with another thought before we open this up for discussion, because I haven't gotten to any of the consequences of what happens if you think this way. There is a, a dictum in Islamic jurisprudence. And since they have no philosophy in Sunni Islam, jurisprudence is everything. Which, that's what tells you what's good and what's bad and what's permissible and what's not, what's recommended and what's discouraged. And this dictum is that reason is not a legislator. So when you're arriving at your judgment about something, reason is not a legislator. Find your scriptural authority on which to base your decision, not reason. Now, if reason is not a legislator, why have legislatures? Does it make any sense? And if you wonder why democratic forms of government are not indigenous to Islam, you, you need look no further than there within the Sunni world. Reason is not a legislator. What's more, legislatures that reach a determination through human law are, in fact, haram. They are a form of shirk because you're counterpoising to God's divine laws, man-made laws, which have no legitimacy. That's why when it's time, for instance, for elections in Great Britain, as we just witnessed, on the Islamist websites, you will see you may not vote for your MP because it is an act of shirk. You are equating man's laws with God's laws. God has already provided us with all the laws that we need. And your role is simply to spread either through dawah or jihad uh, Islam until everything is brought into a state of submission to him and then we will all have salam. Let me stop there and entertain your questions.